Uh, hello, my name is Michael Noland. Uh, I'm here today to do a live training stream on how to extend the editor. Um, the UE4 editor has a lot of different ways that you can plug into it, um, extend it in various different ways, from adding menu items, creating new asset types, um, making details customizations for existing game classes and things like that, or even creating new blueprint nodes, new blueprint pens, or you know entirely new custom editors for other kinds of assets. Um, you want to flip over to the screen? So uh, first off, uh, I'm going to go over a couple of specific ways you can extend the editor. Then I'm going to talk more about other paths and sort of how to learn how to fish. So how to go through the engine, how to look at existing editor code and figure out how a particular thing in the editor was accomplished so that you can use that pattern to build your own thing. So two of the things in the sample project are going to be this test command here. So it's a new button right on the toolbar. And then in the edit menu, um, created this new submenu called Demo Tools. And this list here that you see is actually not a fixed list. It's going to query, going to go through all the classes that have been registered and find anything that extends from a particular subclass and show it up there. So it's really easy to add additional menu items there without having to go through and make new UI code each time. So first off, uh, I created a new project. I'm, I'm going to skip some of the steps here because it just takes a little bit too long for the training stream. But the first thing I did was I created a new project. Um, I just chose the C++ first person template. It doesn't really matter as long as it's a C++ project. Um, and so we're going to create a plugin within that project. You could also add this to your existing game project. You don't have to create a, a whole new project from scratch. Um, then once that was done, I created the template, uh, the plugin file structure here. And so this actually has additional files in it. Like it's not just an empty template. But the basic structure of a plugin is it's going to be under the plugins directory. Um, and then the name of the plugin will be this directory. You also have name of the plugin.uplugin in that directory. And the uplugin file is just a JSON file that describes the plugin as sort of the high level overview of a plugin. So in this case, uh, it's demo editor extensions. And it has two modules it has a runtime module and an editor module. And you can have one or many modules in your plugin. Um, you control various things like what kind of uh, module is it? Should it be run always, like when you're running your standalone game? Should it only be run if you're in the editor? Actually, let me make the text a little bit bigger here. Um, and so each of these modules will then be a separate submodule, just like you'd have in a game project. So we can see here the runtime and the editor modules. So here's the editor module. And it's depending on things like Unreal Ed. This is, this is something that like a typical game project wouldn't depend on. But this gives you access to a bunch of additional things you'll need to make plugins. Um, and this particular plugin also depends on what's called the property editor and the level editor. And I'll go into more detail on that in a little bit. So within each module, sort of, I'll open up the other one real quick. The bare minimum you're probably going to have in a module is a private PCH. And this is the file that every C++ file in your module will include. And then a module CPP. And so this has the implement module in it. So this one doesn't do anything. But if we open up the editor module, you see that you can actually, this is where you'll actually register your extensions with the rest of the editor. So in this case, it implements iModule interface. And startup and shutdown module is sort of the bare minimum if, you, if you're going to do something then this is sort of the meat on how those menu options for like a uh, trigger tool and stuff like that worked. So I'll just scroll down here. So start a module, you can register each different extension point in the editor has some system that you'll talk to. So in this case, uh, what's called the property module uh, is responsible for things like details panels. It's like, you know, when I select an object, this here is a details panel showing a property editor. Um, the property editor module can be used to register customizations or to spawn new instances of it, that sort of thing. And so if we look at this, buttons like these buttons down here are not actually intrinsically present. What's happened is that somebody created a details customization in the editor that will show these buttons when the actor meets certain criteria. Um, so replace with composite blueprint, add new level events and stuff like that. 
um, you can do this yourself. So you can create new details customization. So imagine that, you know, the simulate physics, if that's unchecked, you actually want to just hide a bunch of other properties. What you could do is you can either use an edit condition in the header or you can um, write custom code. So you could even do things like have a button show up or completely change the layout. So UMG does this, for example, where you're picking a pivot point. It's got a 3x3 three three grid. So that's a custom widget that shows you know, where it, it lets you edit the property in a prettier way, I guess is the best way of describing it. And so a lot of these things are just built-in customizations. So I'll just go ahead and use this tool real quick. Let me just select some widgets or some uh, actors. So one of the tools I created here is just a mirror tool. And so this lets you just mirror about a plane all the selected actors. And so you can see here it's flipping in the x-axis. If I change this to be y, it'll mirror on the y-axis and so forth. And so this command here is being shown using a details panel customization. So if we open up the mirror tool class real quick, So the mirror tool, all it has is this property that you can edit, and then a mirror selected objects uh, function. And I marked this function exec, and so that's so I can easily find it uh, when I'm iterating over all the functions in the class. So let's let's um, let's jump back up a little bit, I guess, and walk through what this module is doing and why. So. When the module starts up, first we register the details panel customization. And this is for the base editor tool. So if we look at base editor tool. This is the parent class of that mirror tool. And it doesn't really have much in it. It's just got uh, help text. The main point of this class is just to be able to easily find all of the different tools that we're creating. And so we can look for all classes in memory that derive from this class. So we register a customization on it. And so now what we can do is we can go over here. We look at this customization. So a details customization derives from my detail customization. And it just has one method that you have to implement, which is customize details. And so this method, basically, whenever a details panel is being created to show that object, it will call this and say, hey, do you want to do anything? Do you want to hide properties? Do you want to add new widgets? Do you want to um, change how existing uh, properties are being displayed or change the categorization of them, stuff like that? So we go back in here. Oops. So in this particular case, all we're trying to do is create a button for each one of those functions. And so it goes over the, it gets the set of objects that is being edited. It runs over each one of those and gets the class for that object. And so it's just building up the set of classes. Uh, then it creates a new category to stick the commands in. And it creates a button for each one of those elements. So this is a field iterator. This is how you iterate over metadata. So in this case, we're iterating over all of the functions on the class to find any function that's marked as ex ex executable and that has no parameters. The, you don't necessarily need this, but this is a nice check because we're not handling being able to provide the parameters. All the parameters for these kinds of functions is designed to be passed in via the members of that class. So like we have the mirror plane in the mirror example. Um, so it creates a new custom row in that category and then adds a button to that category. Here, uh, we bound a delegate to execute the tool command, and we pass in the detail builder so we can get the selection set and the function. So when we, build, when we execute that command, we'll run over the objects again, and we'll call function by name with arguments. Uh, you don't need to worry about the specifics of this. This is just sort of the, the machinery by which we can call that function on these particular instances. Um, so if you weren't making a generic system where you have a bunch of different tools, you could just directly do whatever command you want to do right here. Um, so if you had a button that uh, re-rolled the random number on your object each time you clicked on it, 
then you could just directly get you know cast to whatever your class you're customizing is, and then call you know set seed or whatever function you've got on your game class. So that's the detail panel customization. This is a really powerful tool. Like m many parts of the editor are built using just that. Um, so you know, like we open up the static mesh editor, for example. This here is being customized via the details panel customization to provide stuff like lot editing. So there's not a custom chunk of editor code just to know how to display these. They're just regular properties on an object that have been customized slightly. Um, so this saves you ha from having to do a lot of boilerplate and makes things a lot more consistent. So your UI will look roughly the same no matter what editor you're in, things like that. And that's true of most of the other editors, so the sprite editor, um, texture editor, and so on and so forth. So now we'll pop over here. Uh, I'm going to skip over the style and the commands. These are not necessary. They're really useful. Like w once your plugin starts growing beyond a certain size, you're going to want to do things like have cool looking icons on your menu options and things like that. And so in order to do that, you'll have to create a custom style and add new PNGs to your uh, content directory in your game. But to start off, you don't have to actually do any of that. You can just skip it. So now the next big chunk of this particular example is how do we actually get this to show up in the menu? So, you know, we've got this button up here and we've got a button, well, submenu over here. Um, the way you do that is through what are called menu extenders. And so most modules will expose a way of registering extenders. The level editor exposes multiple kinds. So here we see level editor menu, level, uh, ah can't talk today. Level editor module get menu extensibility manager and level editor module get toolbar extensibility manager. And these pretty much do what they say. Uh, the menu extensibility manager lets you extend something somewhere in one of the menus and the toolbar extensibility manager lets you extend something in the toolbar. Um, the same thing is true for like the texture editor or the sprite editor. Things like that will expose a way of getting this list and adding an extender to it. Um, but how do you know where you want to add to it? Um, turns out that there's an option in the editor preferences that lets you that basically turns on debugging for this sort of stuff. So let's go to editor preferences, miscellaneous, and then display UI extension points. Now this only takes effect when the menu is created. So you can't see anything here right now, but if I open up one of these menus that is dynamically created, now you can see this green text that displays the name of these different things. So if we want to see it for stuff like this toolbar, we'll have to actually restart the editor. So let's go ahead and do that. So while it's starting, I can sort of walk through this code. So in order to add something to the menu, you create a new menu extender. You add a menu extension or you add a toolbar extension. And you have to be careful that you use the correct one for where you're extending. Uh, because otherwise it will compile just fine, but it won't do anything at runtime. Like if you try and add a toolbar extender to a menu, there's going to be no errors. It just won't show up. Then you put the hook, which is this green text that we're seeing in the editor. That's basically the name that somebody who created the menu originally said, hey, you can add things either before or after or at the beginning of this list. Um, the, this next parameter is basically where in that, that section you're going to add it. So do you want to add it at the end of the section, the beginning of the section, etc. Um, the command list can be null. Uh, otherwise you can pass in a command list. And this basically lets you bind a set of commands saying like, you know, here are key binds and so forth, uh, icon and all that sort of stuff that I want to use this with. Then the last thing you use is the extension delegate, which is actually what adds the command. So the rest of this is just to cause the editor to call that whenever it's creating its menu or toolbar. So we pop over here. Now you can see that we've got this green text in each one of these sections. And so you can see, like in this game section, game and then test command. And that's being done right here, game and then 
we're going to call the add toolbar commands. And so right here, we just add a toolbar button. And so this works just like if you were creating a completely custom UI with Slate. You know, you're getting passed in a toolbar builder, you're getting passed in a menu builder, and you can add things to that and do whatever you want. And so in this case, the menu builder is going to create a list of the different tools that are available. And the toolbar builder just creates this test command that doesn't actually do anything right now. It's not hooked up to anything. It's just showing how you could add a command to the toolbar as opposed to the menu. So this is the implementation of the tool menu. So edit, demo tools, and then whenever it tries to get the contents of the submenu, it calls this function. And so this function is iterating over all the classes in memory, and it's looking for ones that are not abstract and not deprecated. And so that catches everything that's derived from uh, tool list base, or base editor tool, rather. Um, so this one's marked as abstract because it doesn't actually do anything, but you know the mirror tool isn't. And then it just adds each one to the menu, and it creates an action here to trigger the tool. And it passes in uh, the class via state capture here. So that's just an argument on it. So what this does is it's going to create a new window to show an instance of that. So first it creates a new copy of the class that was passed in. So you know the mirror tool, for example. Um, and in order to prevent it from getting gc'd, since we don't not keeping a reference to this anywhere else, uh, it, gets, it calls add to root to keep it around for as long as you've got the property editor open. So then it puts that into array and calls create floating details view. And so that creates this separate window editing that particular object. And then it binds on window closed on that window so that we can remove it from the root set when you're done. So whenever it's, the window is closed, we go ahead and remove it from the root, and then the object can get GC'd as normal. So I realize that's kind of a lot to take in. Um, but once you've sort of gotten to this point, once you've got a custom plugin and you've got sort of the foundation of you understand how to register with other modules or how to get menu options or create new windows, you can go from there and do almost anything. Um, it depends on exactly what part of the editor you're trying to extend. Some pieces are more or less flexible. Um, but just to give you an idea of some of the different things you can do, let me open this up. So you can add a menu item, icon, or widget to any multi-box anywhere. So multi-box is this sort of thing. So like this right here is a multi-box. So is this. Basically, anywhere where you've got a horizontal or vertical toolbar or menu, that's actually a multi-box under the hood. So like a toolbar builder or a menu builder both create a multi-box. And so the multi-boxes have all that support for extenders where you can stick something in a particular place, that sort of thing. Um, it's also true for even things like context menus. So you can see there's these different extension points here. So if we look at textures, this menu right here is actually done entirely using menu extensions, the Sprite Actions menu. Because everything in Paper 2D was done as a plugin, it's not part of the core engine in that regard. It forces us to make sure that we design things in a way that's extensible. And so the texture menu here is commands that the sprite plugin can do onto a texture. And so basically, you can make actions. So like you can make an action that would invert a texture, or flip a texture, or color balance a texture, anything you can imagine, really. And then based on that, you know, go and modify the asset or create an additional asset from it, et cetera. Um, so that's creating menu items. Uh, you can also create custom widgets. So in the settings here, this distance slider here is a custom widget that's stuck into the menu. So it doesn't have to be just a menu action with a checkbox or anything else. You could actually put arbitrary widgets in there. So you could put a color picker in there. You could put you know, some 2D uh, coordinate entry, whatever you can imagine. Basically, as long as it's a slate widget, you can put it in the menu. Um, one of the simplest ways of extending uh, the functionality, and this is typically done in runtime since you're going to want to do it in your you know, shipping game, not only in the editor, is expose a function to blueprints. And so uh, that's really simple to do. You can just add blueprint callable or blueprint pure to a U function declaration, and it'll show up as callable. Um, 
but you can go further than that. You can actually create new graph nodes. So imagine you've got a uh, custom node. So like the timeline node, for example, has like a little bubble that shows up on top of it saying how much time is left when this timeline component is playing. And so that's done with both a custom K2 node, and, which is sort of the node that lies in the graph, and a custom S graph node, which is the visualization that's used by the graph editor. Um, this can get more or less detail, or what's the best way of saying it? You can extend the blueprint nodes in a lot of different ways. So you can do simple things like subclass from an existing blueprint node. So call function node is sort of the root of a, a large swath of functionality. And so we have things like add component is a subclass of call function that just adds a little bit of extra work on top of it, but still inherits most of the behavior. You can also do things which expand out to other nodes during compilation. So you can make a node without up updating the compiler at all. You can say, hey, this node, when I compile, I actually want to replace it with these other two nodes. Um, so we've got a lot of examples of that in the engine as well. Um, and then all the way up to, if you actually need to extend the compiler, you can actually create a new, um, let me just open this up real quick. Uh, so you can create a node that actually has a node handling functor, which is what's being used by the compiler to actually do the, the work. And so core nodes like variable set, variable get, things like that have their own custom ones. But most of the time, you wouldn't need to go that far. So for example, if you want to have a um, variable node that displays some properties about the current value of that variable, you could derive from variable get and then add a tooltip to the top, for example, instead of having to sort of reinvent the wheel for that kind of thing. Um, so the graph node visualizer is if you want to affect either the placement of the nodes or if you want to affect the how, th how they render, whether or not they choose to show particular pins, you can do that. It's fairly rare. Like the built-in visualizers are usually good enough for most cases. So even if you create a custom node, you probably wouldn't create a visualizer to go with it unless you have a you know an edge case. Um, graph pin visualizers are used to add new pin literal editing capabilities. So for example, you've got a custom struct f in your game that you know say it's got a name and a color associated with it. Instead of forcing you to create a separate literal node and wire it in, you could create a custom uh, pin type that will let you edit both those values in line, just as if it were a built-in type. Um, in a lot of these cases, it's basically find one that works the way you want it to, and then have a look at how that's implemented. So for example, let's just create a new blueprint here. So you can see these green things are everywhere. So so I just dropped a add vector vector node. And so the, these two things here are S graph pin vectors, I believe. But I'll show you how you can figure that out. And this is one of the most useful tools that uh, you'll ever find for figuring out how to write slate code. Uh, it's the widget reflector. If I can find it. So the widget reflector lets you figure out how something was built. So here we can see this is actually part of an S vector text box which if we keep going up a little bit more, it's part of an S-graph pin vector. And so as you can see, you can click through different parts of the tree, and it will actually highlight on the screen where it's being, you know, what the bounds of that widget are. And also, if you built from source, you can click on the widget info right here, and it'll actually open it right up. Sometimes it opens up the wrong project file. 
but this is still immensely useful for like jumping right to where that piece of code was uh, was at. So let's jump just a little bit higher here. So here we can see this is creating it here. So you could have a look at SGRAPH pin vector and then build your own custom pin following that pattern. Um, sort of all the built-in ones are, uh, you know, right here. But before it tries to go through the built-in ones, it goes through this registration system. So you can register with the visual pin factories and make your own custom one. And your custom one will have priority over the built-in ones. So you could look, if it's a struct, and if it's of a struct of your particular type, then create the custom pin factory, factory your custom pin instead of factoring one of the built-in ones. Okay. So you can also create new console commands. Um, this is something you can do even in your runtime game. If you want to create a new console command, you bring down by the tilde command or whatever. Um, this can be useful if you want to have like additional sort of power user commands or you know just simple cheats to execute quickly. Um, so. Whenever you bring up the console, it's by default bound to sort of the top left button on your key keyboard, which is like the tilde or the cursor key. You can type in a command here. And so, like, you can see uh, console variables and things like that, which you can also add. Um, but you can create commands. And so, there, you know, there's an example, like in the Blueprint Stats module, for example. So you can just register console command, and then it's got a delegate that's called whenever you do that command. So you can do dump blueprint stats, and then it'll call that function. Um, so this is a really simple way of exposing functionality without having to necessarily worry about Slate or UI, you know, if you want to just get started on things. So we've already talked about customizing types quite a bit. So you can either customize, you know, like the details panel for a component or an actor, but you can also do struct customizations where, you know, like editing a vector on an actor, for example, like this transform is a custom customization. Um, the one thing to know about struct customizations versus uh, actor customizations is that when you're customizing an actor or an object, you can, by default, it will still show all of the properties. Like, you know, if you do nothing, it defaults to showing all the properties in the, the categories that they show up in. But with the struct customization, as soon as you say, I'm going to customize this, it stops having any default behavior. So it's your job to actually add each property back that you want to show. It's just a little bit of a different default. Um, but you can also customize a property in a struct from the parent actor, if that makes sense. So if, you, if you've got a member named foo of you know, my struct, you can actually customize one of the values within that foo from your, uh, my, your, um, the class customization. So you don't have to go all the way to struct customization if you don't want to. Um, this is something that a number of people asked about on the form, uh, the form thread, which is adding a new asset type. Um, this can go from really easy to actually fairly complicated. The simplest thing to do is to just derive from uData asset. And what that'll do is it'll show it up in whenever you create a new asset, create new. Under uh, miscellaneous, there's a data asset category. And so that just shows a list of all classes that derive from data assets. So that way you don't have to create a factory or anything else. Um, and so that allows you to just create these things simply. So like you can create a Blackboard data by this method. Um, so these data assets can either have a custom editor associated with them, or by default they'll just open up a uh, property editor for them. And again, you can just make a details customization as your customizer for that property editor. Um, if you want to go beyond that, you don't have to, then you would, instead of driving from your data asset, you drive from your object or you know, whatever other asset, like if you're extending an existing one. Um, and then you create a number of additional classes associated with that. So you would create an asset factory 
that would either create a new one or create one from import. Um, and so that you'll create asset type options, which explain basically how the content browser interacts with that asset. Um, so we can have a look at something like that. So the asset type actions allows you to do things like customize the color, like that strip of color that shows up at the bottom or in the background if there's no icon. Um, what actions, if it's got additional custom actions in the menu, um, what categories it'll show up in, in things like the filters and the create new. Basically, it's just explaining how the content browser is going to interact with your asset type. And so if you don't create one of these, then it's going to have those defaults for like the UData asset where it shows up in miscellaneous and doesn't have any custom properties or anything like that. Um, for something like this, I would have a look at an existing example. Uh, so for example, Paper2D, again, because it's made as a plugin, it's got an example of just about every kind of way that you can extend the editor. So you can have a look at, say, a paper sprite or uh, something like that to see how you create uh, you know, the different classes. So you need to have the runtime class, you have the importer, you have the asset factory, etc. cetera. Um, so we can have a look at some of that. So here we've got the asset type actions for it. We've got module. Let me open up this other one real quick. Um, if you want to have a custom thumbnail renderer so that, you know, instead of rendering just this square that says the type on it, you actually want to display something visually if your asset supports that, then you would uh, derive from uh, the one of the different thumbnail renderers and implement draw. And so in this case, it's uh, using the default size thumbnail render, it's not trying to do anything special with the size. And so then we draw a single frame from the sprite, for example. Um, so you've got the thumbnail render, you've got the factory. And so what this factory is, is it's creating a new instance of that asset in the content browser. Um, so this is factory create new. Um, oh, that was the flipbook one, sorry. I wanted the sprite one. And so this factory can have various different parameters that are either set via other means. So like if you create the factory from a particular way, like you right click on a texture and create from that, then this could be populated when the factory is created. Um, or you can have uh, implement configure properties and actually cause a, a details panel to show up right here so you can enter in values. Um, that's a pattern we've kind of moved away, with, away from in the editor but it's still visible in certain things that just you can't get around having some import settings. So, for example, when you import an FBX, there's a dialog that asks you for various settings there. And so that's implemented via this configure properties method. Um, you can also create an actor factory. And so an actor factory is, I've got an asset in the content browser, and I want to drag it out into the level editor. You know, how should that happen? So if we get static meshes here real quick. When I drag this out, it knows to create a static mesh actor, and it does so via finding one of these actor factories that can go from a static mesh asset to a static mesh actor instance. Um, there's a similar thing if you drag and drop one of these component, these assets, into a blueprint. How it knows how to go from the asset to the component is done via a similar method called the component asset broker which knows how to go between a component and the asset, or vice versa. So we can see that here. So that's just an implementation of iComponent Asset Broker that knows how to assign an asset to a component or get asset from component, et cetera.
Okay. So that covers sort of a lot of the interaction with a custom asset type and the main editor. Um, but then if you want to actually create a custom editor, you want something above and beyond uh, just the details panel to edit. So, you know, for example, the blueprint editor is a fairly complicated editor that, you know, has these different modes and so forth and has stuff like this viewport in it. Um, a similar thing can be seen, you know, static mesh editor has this viewport, the, the details panel, but then also has this toolbar at the top. Then what you can do is you can create a custom asset editor and possibly implement a uh, editor viewport client. And so that's what this is right here. And so that allows you to do custom things like change selection, like I can choose things in here. Um, I can add collision to it and move the collision around, those sorts of things. That's all implemented in that uh, editor viewport client that this editor is built on top of. So let's use the widget reflector real quick to see how that works. So we can see this is a static mesh editor viewport that's inside of, you just keep going up, uh, standalone asset editor toolkit host. Um, so the standalone asset editor toolkit host is, it handles some of sort of the, the, the busy work of creating a new asset editor in terms of keeping track of what assets are being edited by who, um, adding options like save and find a content browser, you know, sort of those basic things. So, but if we flip back up here, we go to this guy. Hmm. I'll just open this up in the other one. So we can see here's the module, and whenever you create a static mesh editor, and so this is being called from the static mesh asset type action somewhere, um, it calls, uh, creates a new one and calls init static mesh editor on it. Um, and so this is the kind of thing where there's enough little details that it's best to actually look at a existing example and work from that rather than try and implement it completely from scratch. Um, but generally, the rough shape will be similar. Um, you'll create some widgets that you're going to have inside of it. Um, you'll add those. You'll create this layout. Um, so this layout is a hierarchical layout for the editor that can be, basically, it's automatically serialized. So for example, if I redocked details to down here and then closed and reopened this editor, it would remember that I had done that. And so the layout is basically just saying, OK, I want these tabs to be in this location by default. But then from then on, it'll actually load it from the config I and I instead of loading it from the default, unless you've you know, started a brand new project or whatever. Um, and so a lot of that stuff is basically taken care of for you, as long as you, you know, sort of follow the golden path, if that makes sense. And obviously, you know, sort of if you want, if you have sort of the, the full gamut of things where you've got your asset, it can be a component, it has a custom editor, uh, it has a thumbnail renderer and stuff, there's a lot of these different pieces, but you may not need many or most of these depending on your use case. So for sort of like the core built-in types like static mesh and stuff like that that are these visible renderable things, there's more of these uh, support classes necessary. But if you're just creating a custom asset for your game that's like, say, you know, you've got a tower defense game and it's like a wave manager. So like at this time, three of this enemy show up and at this time, two of this enemy show up and things like that, you wouldn't necessarily need all of these different editors. Like you wouldn't need a thumbnail, you wouldn't need um, a component asset broker, things like that, because you're going to use that asset and you're just going to read that during your gameplay code. Um, the next sort of big class of things you can do is a custom editor mode. And so editor modes are sort of uh, a set of code that can handle input or draw things on top of whatever's going on in an asset editor or in the level editor. 
So these, these buttons right here are actually the different modes that are sort of built in. So things like vertex paint and mesh paint are in editor mode, as is editing landscape. Um, and so these editor modes can do a variety of things. Like they can automatically add UI into this modes dialog up here. So you can see these different buttons, you know, managing it. Um, they can also do custom things in the viewport. So, you know, if we select a mesh, you can see how it's drawing all the vertices and it's drawing the circle on, you know, sort of where is it going to be painted if I start painting right now. Um, so you can create these modes that are like permanent, that are sort of always available and always activatable. But you can also create sort of transient modes. So like you could make, if you have an actor reference and a blueprint and you click on that, it actually opens up an actor picker. So it lets you click somewhere in the viewport to select an actor and then it sets that value on the property. That's actually a, an editor mode that's activated and then torn down as soon as you finish clicking without ever changing this uh, UI up here. So imagine you wanted to make a ruler that lets you, so there's already a ruler in the 2D mode, but if you're in 3D viewport mode, the ruler doesn't work because it's kind of hard to define exactly what that would mean. Like do you click down to the ray or whatever. But imagine we wanted to make a sort of sphere ruler. So you start it by clicking in the viewport with a particular key held down. And then as you click and drag, instead of moving the viewport around, imagine it drew a sphere that grew or shrank and displayed the radius of the sphere on top of it. You could do that as a custom editor mode that's only active and is consuming mouse input for the duration while it's active. And so you can do a lot of interesting things there if you want to have custom uh, region definitions or something along those lines. Um, a related piece is called the component visualizer. And so spline components don't actually use an editor mode, but they use a component visualizer instead. And so editing spline components and adding vertices on the spline is using uh, that component visualizer. They're mechanically very similar, and at some point in the future, we'll probably end up merging those two classes so that you know the component visualizer is really just a kind of editor mode. But for now, they're separate. And you can just pick and choose which one of the two you'd like to use. Um, some of the other things that you wouldn't do on their own, but they serve a means to an end, are things like uh, a drive slate style or in a command list. And so what those allow you to do is the command list allows you to say, like, here are the default key bindings for something. And so they'll automatically show up whenever that command list has been instantiated in the key bindings menu. So editor settings, do, 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 keyboard shortcuts. And so you can see each one of these has different commands in the default bindings form. And you can use it for things that don't have a key binding by default, but you know, that still lets people go in and add a binding later on. And so the command list you know, can look something like this. So a uh, command list is derived from T commands. And the, the argument to the constructor is the name of the class itself. Um, and so you'll have the context name. And so that's what's going to show up. Th that's, that's the best way of describing that. Um, that's what's going to be used sort of under the hood when it's binding the commands. This next thing is actually the name and the hierarchy of it. Um, so like here's the demo editor and then the parent. And so we'll see the commands here. There's not really any in there, but they will show up in here. So we see the test command. Um, and you can also specify a parent. So instead of showing up at the top level here, if you specify a parent, it would show up nested underneath that other uh, object. So if you've got, you know, say you wanted to do commands by mode within a particular editor, you can make those the underneath it. So like the level editor, I think, is like that, for example. Or maybe not. Looks like those are all top level. Um, but yeah, in the command list, you always implement register commands. And that's where you'll actually bind the command. And so you can say, this is my command. This is my uh, the description of the command. That'll show up in the menus and stuff. And then you can say what the tooltip for that command will be as well. And then the kind of user interface action. So this can either be button, which is like it's a clickable thing. But it can also be toggle button, so it's a checkbox. 
a radio button will mean like there might be multiple options in a group. So say you've got a 1x, 2x, and 4x uh, zoom level. Those might be three radio buttons in a single group. And then check boxes uh, like a toggle button. It's just, it's read only. So it shows you what the value is, but it doesn't actually let you change it. So you might use that if you've got three options in a menu that you want to show kind of like a radio button. And then the last thing is this input gesture. So the input gesture lets you say things like, you know, control F should be the input gesture for find, for example, or control alt or whatever. Um, so that lets you set the default key binding for that command. When you've got a command set, um, on its own, it doesn't necessarily do anything. Like this describes sort of the shape of the command, but it doesn't describe what it actually does. And so if you then want to use those commands, you would bind that command in the particular context. So for example, we can look at So uh, here it's map action. So basically it's saying, you know, here's the command. So for example, we have this test command over here. We can map that command to say, execute this. And you can also do things like saying, can execute. So if you, it's only valid to execute the command under certain circumstances, you can run this delegate before it's executed. Um, and you can also, for things that are like a checkbox, you can say, is action checked and so forth. So like you just look at, the declaration for map action here. See, there's a number of different forms for it that take different arguments. So you can bind just the command directly to execute, execute and can execute, um, so on and so forth. And so that's what you would do. And so you can actually have it do different things in multiple cases. So, you know, the, like the compile button in the blueprint editor is, you know, declared as this one global command that's, the, you know, full blueprint editor commands compile but it does something different in each instance of the Blueprint Editor. And so that's how you say, you know, I want it to do this in this particular case. Um, the other thing is uh, editor style. So, for example, So you create a style set, and you can bind things to it. So for example, you can say, you know, this path within the style set should be this icon, for example. Um, these macros are just you know, kind of helper macros. So it'll be like, in this content directory, I want it to be this. So you can see here, uh, for the Paper 2D plugin, it's using engine plugins dir, and then the path to the rest of it. Uh, in your own game plugin, it would be uh, game plugin dir. And then, you know, name of the plugin. So, for example, in the case that we're working on, it would be um, demo editor extensions. For example. And so then you create a directory inside of your content directory named slate in that plugin. And so you could add additional icons in there. So like we have a look at this. So here we can see these icons that are being used for the Paper 2D editor. So that, that's basically how you can add icons in a plugin without having to edit the engine, without having to put any content in the engine content directory. Do that. So another cool thing that you uh, was just recently introduced is you can actually create a new interactive tutorial, um, and so that's basically just a blueprint right in the content browser that lets you do things like describe how your plugin works, describe how you know a game sample works, or things like that. Um, 
I won't go into too much more detail here. I think there's documentation on how to create tutorial documentation uh, available. But that's a really great way of uh, teaching users how your plugin works. Um, so you can go walk through an example. Uh, sh you know, you can even do things like highlight individual nodes in a blueprint, um, highlight actors in the level, and things like that. Um, let's see. Um, one other thing I'll talk about. This is not exactly extending the editor, but it's it's another useful thing for automating the editor. Um, you can do things called automation scripts and execute those using run UAT. So automation scripts are basically a way of using C Sharp to script some, some aspect of the editor or do something arbitrary. Um, so m like our build system, for example, you know, using Cook and stuff like that actually uses the automation system. So there's this script called run build cook, I think. Build cook. Build cook run dot automation dot CS. And so this script is actually what's under the hood when you use the launch button, when you use the uh, package dialog, and so on and so forth. All of them sort of will funnel into this script, and that's what uh, ends up cooking it, what ends up uh, running it on another platform, and et cetera. And so it, you don't have to use it to do this. I mean, you can create uh, completely arbitrary uh, C Sharp scripts. But this is nice because there's a lot of helpers and utilities to do things like um, Syncing with Perforce or syncing with your source control provider, um, those sorts of things. Like you want to make a custom script that like prepares a build, this is a pretty good way of going about it. And I've even used it for one-off scripting things where I needed to find all the files that you know met a certain criteria or things like that. Um, it, you know, it's basically just a a framework in which to write C# -sharp scripts, basically. Um, do, do, do. There's a bunch of examples in the engine already. Um, so basically, just find one that you know sort of roughly does what you want, or create a new one ba uh, using that as a pattern, and then you'll rebuild the module that it's in. So for example, we look at this one, and so we can see that there's like automation scripts that automation, and you know so on and so forth. And so your your script will be in one of these projects, and then you build that, and then you can just run run UAT on it. Um, I think Run UAT may actually compile it for you. So, like, if you're iterating on it, you may not have to uh, remodify it. But just Run UAT and then the name sort of before the dot automation dot cs. So you just do Run UAT space build cook run space and then the parameters for that command. So in this case, you know, you'd need the project path, um, so on and so forth. But you know, the parameters are different for every command. Um, uh, so one other thing that, again, doesn't exactly qualify under extending the editor, but it's really useful for doing things that you might only do in the editor, is using the user construction script. So in a blueprint, you've got sort of the, the components tree, which is just like, I always create these components. Then you've also got the user construction script, which is a chance to run some code on spawn. You can also use, do that in native code. You don't have to use blueprints to do this. But you can use that to do things like trace around the actor and find other, you know, make it conform to the train to spawn like a fence between two points or things like that. So you can either have it happen always when it reruns. And so like as you drag it around, it's constantly rerunning. Or you can gate things using a Boolean. And so what you could do is every time that Boolean is clear, it will run that code, and then set the Boolean again. And so basically, the Boolean becomes a button. So you can click on that Boolean value, and it will automatically run that block of code that you've gated by the Boolean. And so you know you can imagine in here, if I dropped one of these blueprints down, like right here, and it's between these two actors, um, I could have it wrote, shoot like a, a, a line out to either one and you know basically create a clothesline between the two, or create a fence between the two. Um, and that's one of those things where, you know, if you work smarter, you know, if you've got a ton of content to create, creating those sort of like helpers or utilities can really save a lot of time. Um, probably the last thing I'll talk about is undo redo, and I'll just go over the mirror tool, and then I'll jump over to questions and stuff.
So here's the actual implementation of mirror selected objects. Um, what it's doing is it runs over the all the selected actors, and you get that from GEditor. And then it figures out what the current position is, and it mirrors that current position via the mirror plane to figure out where the new position should be, and then it sets it. Um, so if you just did that, and you commented out these other lines, oops, then what would happen is that it wouldn't be undoable. Like, basically, that action is actions default to not being undoable. And so you have to opt in to saying, I want to remember this so that if I undo, it gets undone. And so the way you do that is you start a transaction. And so there's a couple different ways to do this, but 99% of the time you'll use a scope transaction. And that basically says, hey, this is a command I'm doing that I want to be undoable. And so you give it a friendly name using log text saying, you know, this is the action that's going to show up in the undo history. And so you also see if you undo, it'll say undoing mirror about plane. Then for any object that you're going to modify, like if you're going to change the properties or uh, call function on it or whatever that would mutate it, then you call modify before you do that modification. So what that does is the first time an object is modified inside of a transaction for you know, a given transaction, it will actually remember the state. And so basically it's like, I'm going to take a snapshot of this actor, and then anything that happens when the transaction is finalized is stored as part of that modification. And so it knows that you know, as part of setting actor location, this actually goes down a couple of objects under the hood, but it's still enough to capture the undo state, if that makes sense. So for example, let's select these guys. It's because the console's still open. So there, undo mirror about plane. You can see they pop back to their original location. Um, and so this can go, you know, arbitrarily more complicated. Like if I were actually, you know, modifying a particular value on a, a particular object within it, then I could say, you know, say actor had a member, you know, my sub object. And then. And so that would remember that that value had been modified and restore it on the f when the undo is finished. Um, one thing about these is that the values that are that are remembered for modify are values that are reflected. So if you have a native value that's in there, then you would need to implement um, you need to serialize that yourself when uh, it's going into the undo. But if it's by default, if it's tagged, so you property or things like that, that will automatically work. Um, actually, one other thing I didn't cover in the list of things you can do, but is really useful, especially when you're creating your own custom asset types and stuff, is what's called post-edit undo. So I'm just going to go on a little tangent here. Oops. Or sorry, post-edit change, not uh, post-edit undo. Sorry. So this method here is a with editor only object, uh, sorry, with editor only method on you object. And so this lets you do things after, after something has been edited via most means in the editor. So if you, it's edited by the details panel, if it's edited uh, via things like that, um, this function will get called. And so this function lets you sort of do fix up work if you want. So for example, if somebody edits the size to be a negative value, you can say, no, that's not allowed. The size has to be at least 1.0. Uh, so for example, you know, this this right here checks a value, and if it goes below zero, it resets it to a default of one. There's some metadata as well, so you can actually say things like um, meta UI min equals value, meta UI max equals value, things like that, to clamp it. But this can be useful if like properties are interrelated dependent. So if, if this value is true, 
then this other value is limited. But if it's false, it's not limited. And so it lets you do those sorts of things. Um, you can also do things like resize buffers. So imagine you've got a 2D array, and you've got a width and a height. So you could then sort of have your old saved width and your old saved height. And if the user visible width and height change, then you can reallocate and copy over the portion of the old array to the new uh, instance of the array. Um, but just in general, this is a really helpful thing so that you don't have to do a bunch of custom UI code. You can just say, when these values get modified, something should happen. Um, just one other quick uh, useful thing is this get member name checked macro. So rather than writing, and this, this would be just fine, it would compile, but it's fragile. So you could just check directly against the string name. But now if I went in and modified that, you know, if I edited the class and renamed that property, this would still compile fine, but the code in here would never execute anymore. And so we've got this macro that at compile time verifies that in this scope, this identifier is valid. Um, it's a little bit of macro magic. You don't have to worry about the implementation of it, but it just makes your code in here more robust. So you use this macro both when you're doing like details panel customizations or when you're doing um, post-edit change property. All right. So I think that's about all I've got for sort of the, the many different ways you can extend the editor. So let's uh, jump over to questions here. Let me pull up the chat. OK, um, so first question is from Abitron. Will editor extensions be supported in the marketplace? Um, that's definitely the plan. Uh, right now, we're still figuring out exactly how we want C++ extensions to work in the marketplace. Um, because we're using C++, there's no real binary ABI compatibility. And so you'd have to recompile the plugin for every major engine version. And so we're, you know, we need to work through some of the logistics there. But we absolutely want to support C++ plugins in the marketplace in the future. Um, let's see here. Would it be possible to, Brainjack's asking, would it be possible to create an own node based editor like the BP editor or the material editor? And what would you need to do so? So, yeah, that's absolutely possible. Um, so, the sound cue editor and the material editor, the blueprint editor, and the behavior tree editor are all using the graph editor. And so, what you do is have a look at one of the existing implementations there. And that's the pattern you'd use. Um, so there's a couple different pieces. You need to create something that contains an S graph editor. You need to create a new graph schema, um, which is a subclass of UED graph schema, which describes sort of what actions are valid on nodes and how can you create new nodes. And you'd create a new base subclass of UED graph node. And so, you know, for blueprints, that is UK2 node. For Anim graphs, it's you anim graph node, uh, so on and so forth. And sound cues, it's uh, I think it's you sound graph node. I want to say. Um, so it's not trivial, but it's not actually that difficult. Um, there's a number of different examples in the editor, and I probably just dig into one of those. Um, don't forget, you can always use the widget reflector to sort of figure out how something's working in an existing part of the UI. Um, Zumba Pup asked, is there any documentation on the various manager classes we can hook for the editors? I don't think there's any documentation right now. Um, I'm going to take the list I was showing uh, in here and turn that into a form post or a wiki post. And you know, over time, we'll end up with all that stuff documented. It's just you know, it's a matter of priority right now. So. Yannick Lange was asking, currently using modes for rendering text in the viewport for my multi-edit plugin. Was wondering if this is possible without modes. I'm assuming you mean editor modes. Um, if you want to render you know, text on something that's selected, you could potentially use the component visualizers instead of editor modes. But otherwise, there's not really you know, a lot of ways of doing editor-only display of things in a component. Like the component visualizers is really sort of the other way for that. So if you wanted to have, say, a... Um, a radius, and so you draw a sphere. You know, enemies within this radius are going to be targeted by this turret, for example. Um, you could do a component visualizer to draw a sphere, you know, around the object when it's in the editor, but not in other modes. And you could do text in the same way. Um, do, do, do. 
Fortune Studios Games was asking, is there a way to hide you property categories without editor code? Um, yeah, so sort of. You can't hide it without editor code, but you can hide it without having to do de uh, details panel customizations. So there's a method on you object. Uh, do you want to flip over to the screen? Oops. Uh, do, do, do. So I'm not 100% sure. I think you can do things like can edit change. So you could make them read only. I don't know if you can actually hide them this way. But there's a couple of methods that you can sort of use to dynamically um, update things. Like can edit change is, you know, sort of it predates the, the details panel customization, but it's still another way of adding some input into it. So the details panel customization will respect that. Um, but otherwise, I don't think there's an easy way of hiding them. Um, I assume you want to do it dynamically because otherwise you could just leave the category off. I mean, if they're properties that you want to be reflected but not editable, you could always just leave off the edit anywhere and the category name, and then they won't show up. Um, Abitron Games was asking, is there any way to reorder the property categories? And yeah, absolutely. Um, in the details customization, so let's have a look here. So whenever you do edit category, that sort of sets the order for that category. So like everything you do here until the end of this function is setting and structuring what the order in which properties are going to show up. And then at the end of the function, any properties that weren't customized will then, always, will then all be sort of thrown in. And if it has to add new categories to do so, it'll add those categories below it. Um, if you want to explicitly hide categories in here, you would call like, you know, category dot hide property, or maybe it might actually be on the detail builder directly. Yeah, detail build hide property. Um, but with the categories, you can, you know, sort of roughly set the order here. There's still a few built-in categories that you'll inherit that, you know, you don't have direct control over, but you can still specify the priority. So for example, on an actor, there's this transform section that's at the top no matter sort of what you do in your details customization by default. So even if I called um, edit category static mesh, it would still show up after the transform by default. But you still have control over that. What you can do is when you edit category, um, w the next parameter is the cat it, well the next parameter is the localized name. So we'll just do text for that because we're not localizing this right now, although obviously you ought to. And then the last one is the category type. And so you can say it's important or it's transform. And so this is basically the sort category, sort priority within that tree. And so typically you probably wouldn't go anything above type specific, but you can actually go up to important or you can even go as high as transform and then that'll force it to be above the transform itself. So that lets you, you know, order the categories. So Yannick Lange is asking, uh, is it allowed to set up replication inside the editor? Uh, he's doing custom serialization right now and not sure if that's the way to go. Um, Yes-ish. Uh, so like Blueprints, for example, you can define uh, custom replication in Blueprints. But there's a lot of machinery under the hood that makes sure that everything you know, goes well there. Um, you know, like the compiler validates various things. And um, so it's not something I would necessarily try and do off, you know, sort of dynamically in the editor. I would probably either define it in C++ or um, define it using a blueprint. What you can do though is like if you define in C++ that you're going to use like T-Array replication to replicate an array of things, you could then add additional things to that array in the editor, for example. Um, uh, LT Wabo is asking, besides the awesome stream lesson, will be there some sort of setup documentation to refer to certain features discussed in the video? For example, how to add a thumbnail to the menu bar next to the play button. Um, so I'm going to give this, uh, the project here that shows how to like have this test command up here and this edit menu command. 
Um, so this will be available for download. So you'll be able to actually see exactly how this, these particular buttons were done. Um, for most other things, I just recommend sort of, you know, finding something in the editor that works the way you want it to. And again, using the widget reflector or just looking at code to figure out how things work. Um, you know, there's an example for basically everything. It's just a question of, you know, you know, finding your way through the code to actually use it. Um, Yannick Lange is asking, are there differences in multi-threading with multi-threading in games, plugins and games? Um, not strictly speaking. Uh, so by default, pretty much everything you're going to do with uobjects or gEditor and things like that will have to happen on the main game thread. But there's no reason you can't uh, start up a task graph or start up um, a send tasks into a thread pool or whatever in order to go wide. Like if you want to compress textures, you know, you might be compressing the different MIPS simultaneously or things like that. Um, but, you know, at a high level, it's got the same threading model as the runtime game. Um, Mr. 160H is asking, could you explain the differences between the different tab roles? Uh, sure. So there's sort of three different tab roles at high level. So, for the most part, major tab, panel tab, and nomad tab are sort of the three ones you'd be thinking about. And I'll, document tab is used in a few very specific circumstances. So a major tab is something like this entire level editor. Like this right here, this example map, is a major tab. If I open up a new asset editor, that's a major tab as well. And so major tabs can be docked in with other major tabs, but they can't be docked in anywhere else. So like I can't dock this here with this details panel. Because that details panel is called a panel tab. Um, and so a, a panel tab always exists within the context of a major tab. So I can pull this off, and I can dock it anywhere else in here. But see, I can't dock it in a different major tab. It's like this doesn't belong, this belongs to the level editor, so it can't be docked into the uh, static mesh editor. So I'll dock that back there. And the same goes the opposite direction. It's like this details panel. I can't dock it anywhere inside of the asset editor because it belongs to somebody else. Um, the third kind is a nomad tab. And so this is a nomad tab, this widget reflector. It doesn't have a home. Like, it can be docked anywhere. So I can dock the widget reflector, you know, down here. But I can also dock it over here. So a, a nomad tab is basically the same thing it can even be docked to the top level. So it can behave sort of like a major tab or a panel tab, depending on the circumstances. Um, but typically, nomad tabs, their locations are not memorized. So you know, if I dock it up here and then close and reopen the editor, it will have disappeared, because it's really just designed for you know, that one instance, that one run. Whereas the panel tabs within a, a major tab are memorized. So if I close and reopen the static mesh editor after docking it on the left, it remembers that. See, it keeps, keeps uh, record of all that sort of stuff. Um, and then the last option is document tab. Um, this is actually pretty rare. Pretty much the only thing that uses document tabs are the blueprint editor and, the anim and persona. And so th this here is a well where the document tabs show up. So if I add some new functions, see, it's creating new document tabs in here. And so document tabs, you know, they can actually be docked pretty much with the same rules as uh, no, uh, panel tabs. So they can dock somewhere within it, or they can be pulled off. Um, but in general, you're probably not going to use document tabs unless you've got additional functionality on top of that to like remember you know, what documents were open and in what order in that asset editor. So the Blueprint editor stores that data back into the uBlueprint class, for example. Um, so Jared Theriot, I'm sorry if I'm not pronouncing your names right, by the way. Um, how can we make a static library of functions in a module available to C++ users and not just Blueprint users? Um, so the way you'll do that is you'll just create your class, and you want to put it in your runtime module. So for example, like, let's just have a look here. Oops. So for example, this is the gameplay statics class, and this is in the engine. And this exposes functions both to Blueprints and to C++ users. And so it's used in both ways. Um, and so it's just, 
a class that derives from Blueprint Function Library, and you don't have to derive from this. If you only want to expose it to C++, then you could just make a static class that has methods on it, and that would be absolutely fine. Um, but the key thing is that it needs to be somewhere in the runtime module, so it's available even in your you know cooked game. And so in this case, it's in the engine itself, but the plugin I created for this demo, for example, I didn't have anything in the runtime because there, you know, all that was edited only things. But I could just as easily create a new public file here that has the header and a private file that has the the implementations, and then I could reference that and say like you know you my function library colon colon function name, and use that in C++. Um, what you want to do is you need to depend on that module. So like if it's in your game module, you'll depend on it automatically. Um, project plugins, like you know, it's not necessarily going to have them uh, in scope by default, if that makes sense. So a form question is, I have classes developed in a separate module with dependent blueprints, but I'm unable to merge the code and blueprints into the original game module. I'm wondering how the classes are namespaced, uh, if they're namespaced by module or not. Uh, so the answer is that they are namespaced. Um, they're namespaced, so like it'll be like slash script slash module name. So we can have a look at the base engine INI, for example. So. When you move something, um, if you move like a native class, either within your own project or you want to copy code from one project to another, what you may need to do is uh, add a class redirect. And so you can do this in your default engine.ini. Um, so there's a bunch of examples here in base engine.ini where we've renamed or moved a component. So like let's go down to find one that where it's actually changed packages. So. Here's one where K2 node bound event got moved to blueprint graph. And so you can see here, new class name is slash script slash blueprint graph dot K2 node underscore actor bound event. So it, it got both renamed and moved. And so what you would do is, you know, in your default engine.ini for your specific game, you would just add entries like this for any classes that you're trying to move around. And that way the references will get fixed up at load. Um, one of the other questions from the forum was, can I make it, can I make it so that the little eye icon in the scene outliner actually disables actor creation when playing? And so I think what you're talking about here is basically making it so that if this was unchecked, this object wouldn't even get spawned, as opposed to currently what this actually controls is editor visibility, but it doesn't affect any other visibility. Um, that's not something that's uh, extensible right now. Like you would have to, um, you could probably add a command in here. And, but even there, you would need to edit how like the world is actually duplicated to make actors um, be able to be disabled in that way. So like that's not something that's immediately easy to do. One thing you might be able to do is move it into another level, like create a disabled level, and basically just unload that level before you hit play. So like if you want to keep actors around, you can just move them into that level, and then you know use the level as sort of your granularity for enabled or disabled. That ought to work. Um, so I think that's all the questions I've got in this document here. Um, so let me just find the Twitch chat real quick. Yeah, so does anybody else have any other questions or uh, comments? Okay, cool. Well, um, I hope you guys found this helpful. I know it's a lot of information to cover, but it can be really valuable and you can do some really awesome things extending the editor. So I hope, I'm looking forward to seeing what you guys create.